Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of <clears throat> fun and wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Chancellor of Cheerfulness, your Archbishop of Banterbury, your Sommelier of Cinema, and lest we forget, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett. Once again, I'm Rob casting at you from the Rob Observatory. You, you imagination connoisseurs, you who make up this, the post-geek singularity community. It's a Friday, and lo and behold, yet more movies have been taken off the schedule. There will be no Top Gun 2 Maverick this year. You know, I have to tell you, I mean, I, I am your chancellor of cheerfulness. I will keep the British end up. I will, whatever you want, I'll, I'll be the happiest man in the world. But I have to tell you, as the days go by, New Mutants, Dune, still coming out this year, maybe? That's all. That's all we're going to get. I don't know what I'm going to talk about come the fall and the winter. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, this show will, uh, I'll, I'll just make it, I'll just make it all about letters. I don't know. You know, it's every day. I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm trying. It's like, uh, I'm trying Ringo. I'm trying real hard, but every day it's like every day, my, my expectations, my enjoyment, something gets dashed. However, not all bad. You know why it's not all bad? Because I have viewers like Kaz Graphics. I don't know if Kaz Graphics watches Rob's Observations. He certainly watches Elizabeth's whining about movies. Why do I bring him up? Kaz Graphics, uh, he sent me something that I never would have thought. And, and by the way, this is a, a total uh, uh, Rob Observation free of charge, I'm going to endorse a product. No one paid me to do this. I just want you all to know that as movies get canceled, as movies get canceled, as my, as my joy in life, things I love keep getting taken away from me, another door always opens and I find something that I love. Not just that I love, that I love to like the nth degree. What is that, you might ask? You want to know what it is? Thanks to Kaz Graphics, a loyal viewer of this channel. He sent me something from my hometown. I have to tell you, I know, I know. My childlike sense of wonder also extends to the food I eat. This. This, my friends. Beecher's Smoked Flagship Mac and Cheese. I, I mean, I have to tell you, few things in life that I've put in my mouth have given me the kind of joy <laughs> that this does. Now, I've heard that this is Oprah's favorite mac and cheese. Why would I ever doubt Oprah? I, I, I never have before, but I had never had this. And thanks to Kaz Graphics, who has sent me cheeses from Beecher's. And I, apparently, there's Beecher's in Seattle and there's Beecher's in um, NYC. I was unaware of Beecher's. I mean, I grew up in Seattle, but I left a long time ago. But let me tell you that I, I'm a huge fan of, like, I love mac and cheese. My favorite mac and cheese of all time was from Lola's on Fairfax in L.A. It's my favorite mac and cheese. Lola's has not existed since 2013. Now, I do like a, a, a good frozen mac and cheese from the um, store. And I'm a big fan of Trader Joe's mac and cheese. I think it's a fine mac and cheese. But, but this, but this, ladies and gentlemen, this mac and cheese, I got to tell you, I mean, I don't own stock in Beecher's. I don't know why I'm late to this party, but by God. Beecher's mac and cheese, smoked apple sandalwood, whatever it is. First of all, you had me at smoked. Anything smoked, I'll eat. Uh, but my God, this mac and cheese. I don't know. I, 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 you know, 
I don't know what kind of. Uh, I, I'm thinking one of the Astari, probably like Gandalf. You know, one of, one of the Lord of the Rings mystics had to have come to Earth, and whatever the Beecher's cheese is already amazing. So it should not. It should not have surprised me. Not to belabor the point, but this is some damn good, some damn good mac and cheese. And I have to tell you, uh, Kaz Graphics sent it to me, and it comes, uh, I mean, it's frozen. It came in this giant box, and I have to say, the box was beautifully packed, frozen, but there was only one of these in the box. I mean, I would have sent, they, they could have put 20 of them. I I, I don't know how, how big that box would be, but by God... Beecher's Smoked Flagship Mac and Cheese. If you were ever feeling low and you thought that our COVID-19 year of 2020, there's nothing that could put a smile on your face, let me tell you, this mac and cheese could do that. It could, it could, it could very well, whatever doldrums you might be facing, Beecher's Mac and Cheese, I'm telling you, try this shit. It is, it is, it's smoking. It really is. And uh, that that's how I'm beginning the show today. So there you go. Uh, I've lost my other glasses. So Elizabeth uh, loaned me these. Not exactly my color, but hey, there you go. How about that? How do these, people always uh, uh, write disparaging things about these $5 plastic glasses I get from Amazon. But you know what? Kind of digging the color. Kind of enjoying it. I don't know. Maybe maybe I shouldn't enjoy it as much as I am, but I am. So anyway, I you know, I was gonna talk about like all did you all watch the Star Trek panel at San Diego? The the Sa San Diego from home. Did you watch it? The Star Trek Universe panel? I was gonna talk about it today. I was I absolutely was gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna talk about this. But then I felt, I felt like talking about that Star Trek panel would be like making fun of a kid that was in a class lesser than mine, like when I was in elementary school. So I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait until Star Trek Lower Decks debuts, and then I'm going to talk about Star Trek. I just, I, I just feel that that I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make fun of 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 uh, of the the problem child. It's it's easy pickings. Maybe lower decks will be great. I want it to be great, but I have to tell you, I I well, you know what? Let's just let's just wait. I'll talk about Star Trek when lower decks debuts first week of August. Until then, let's uh, let's be optimistic. I'll tell you what is cool though. Uh, you know me, I'm like Fox Mulder. I want to believe. And there's been a lot of talk about declassifying all of our UFOs and the Pentagon thing and leave it to the Daily Mail in the UK to jump on a story like this. Let's, let's share it, shall we? Pentagon's UFO hunting department was not disbanded in 2012, as stated, and could now give public reports every six months. Amid claims, it it found vehicles not made on this earth. How cool is that? Now, then it gives you these, these bullet points, but the Pentagon's once secret department that hunts and investigates UFOs has continued to operate over the past decade despite previous claims it was disbanded. The Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, because... Everyone searches for UFOs, but they don't search for UAPs. Has been tucked away inside the Office of Naval Intelligence and is now being called on to reveal at least some of its findings to the public every six months, according to the New York Times. In, by the way, I, I could have read the New York Times story, but I thought it was better if I read it from the Daily Mail, because isn't that more fun? Information on mysterious encounters with unidentified aerial objects has formerly only been discussed in classified briefings, and Pentagon officials are still not at liberty to discuss the program, which deals with classified matters. 
The new calls for greater transparency come as officials who previously worked with the unit reveal some of the objects discovered in their investigations were items humans couldn't make ourselves and vehicles not made on this earth. I mean, this is like tossed off. Of its, well, you know, um, these are vehicles not made on this earth. Like, what? What? Well, uh, are you telling me that there's not only alien intelligence out there, but but somehow they're crashing their 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 ships like on Earth, and it, it hasn't been big news? I mean, come on. In April 2020, the Pentagon released footage of three sightings. By the way, one of them, I saw somebody tweet to me today. It said, "You know, these are justified. They're they've been debunked as like birds." I don't know, man. I've watched these videos. They don't look like birds. Former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid is among those pushing for more information. I would think that everybody on Earth, all the captains of industry, if there is, in fact, you know, the only person that's out there is Joe Rogan with Bob Lazar. And there's videos on YouTube from truthsayers who will tell you whether Bob Lazar's body language means he's telling the truth. I mean, what about Occam's razor, man? I'm thinking, well, I'd like to believe that aliens are here. But the real question is, why are they here? What do we have to offer to them? And and are they just, are they joshing? Do they, do they like to bring our uh, fighter craft? Are they making fun of us? I mean, what are they doing? And uh, why I, w I would like to know. I'm like Jodie Foster. I want to go to Vega. I I'm good to go. So if you want to take me and probe my anus, you can. I'm telling all the aliens out there, why, why be so secretive? Why not just make it happen? Last month, U.S. senators demanded to see the Pentagon's UFO files as they pushed for influence over the secretive Navy program. The Senate Intelligence Committee wanted defense chiefs to publish a report on the Pentagon's UFO program and any phenomenon it observes. The committee says it supports the efforts of the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force appearing to confirm that such a program existed. In 2017, the Pentagon acknowledged funding a secret multi-million dollar program named the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program to investigate UFO sightings, although defense chiefs claimed it had ended in 2012. It was determined that there were other higher priority issues. Other higher priority issues that merited funding? And it was in the best interests of the DOD to make a change, a spokeswoman said at the time. Okay, so there are extraterrestrial craft visiting Earth, buzzing our fighter jets, and there's other higher priority issues? Well, what are those? Uh, the, the, the National Ghostbusters Fund? I mean, are you kidding me? What? But the Pentagon has been less clear about whether the UFO program continued to hover, get it, somewhere in the vast universe of the U.S. defense establishment. The DOD takes seriously all threats and potential threats to our people, our assets, and our mission, and takes action whenever credible information is developed, the spokeswoman said. People who worked with the UFO program through to 2017 and beyond have now confirmed to the New York Times that it continued to exist, but under a different name and a different office. <laughs> the program first began in 2007 under the Defense Intelligence Agency, but has now moved to the Office of Naval Intelligence. We're not the Space Force. I would think the Space Force would take over this. Wouldn't they be the first? I don't know. Uh, where last month the Senate Intelligence Committee revealed it to be called the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force. For those of you who haven't seen the video, here's like part of one. I mean, th this is our jet following an aircraft that they cannot explain. This is real, people. Real. Uh, anyway, it no longer has to hide in the shadows, says Luis Elizondo a former military intelligence official and the program's previous director. Can you imagine if you're the director of this program? Like, you come home and your wife's like, 
Hi, honey. How was work? Well, uh, well, dear, you know, um, once again, we found more evidence of extraterrestrial incursions into our airspace. And she's like, well, that's nice. By the way, uh, so-and-so got a D on their report card. <laughs> anyway, the force was revealed in a Senate bill in June as senators now want to regulate the program. So not only have they revealed this program still exists, but now senators, great, what could go wrong, want to regulate the program. Regulate what? <laughs> like like the extraterrestrial uh, welcome committee? I don't know. Anyway, the force was revealed in the Senate bill in June as senators now want to regulate the program, saying the public should be better informed of its activities. <laughs> you think? There's UFOs, people. There's alien intelligence visiting Earth, and they're arguing about whether or not we should be better informed. <laughs> the Senate's focus on the program stems less out of a concern over extraterrestrials, however, and more from the threat posed by real-world U.S. adversaries such as China. Well, China is closing our embassy, right, today? <laughs> you know what? We're not so worried about extraterrestrials, but the threat of China, I mean, you never... I've never seen... Uh, I've never seen a movie about China invading the United States with giant 15-mile-long city destroyers. But I have seen movies like that about extraterrestrials. Extraterrestrials scare me more than the Chinese. The Chinese make great electronics. They um, great Blu-ray players. I have a lot of Chinese material. And I like Chinese girls. So what can you say about China? They're not more dangerous than extraterrestrials. But apparently, apparently, the Senate believes that they are. All right. The Pentagon admitted in June that a nuclear detonation in space by Russia or China, was among the possible threats to U.S. interests. You think? I mean, remember, the Russians are already uh, testing in space satellite-destroying weapons they've made. Anyway, the U.S. is particularly worried about China's espionage capabilities, including use of drones and or other aerial technology. Earlier in July, Florida Senator, Senator Marco Rubio, the acting chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, told CBS that he was concerned about unidentified, unidentified aircraft flying over U.S. military bases. I would be an, I would be concerned about that too. <laughs> unidentified air. There are unidentified aircraft flying over our military bases. Is this happening a lot? Uh, I, I'd be concerned about that, too. He claimed that China or Russia may have made some technological leap that allows them to conduct this sort of activity. Uh, I don't know, Marco. Uh, I, uh, uh, if that's the case, we should be a little bit more concerned than this, shouldn't we? The UFO program is responsible for collection and reporting on unidentified aerial phenomenon, any links they have to adversarial foreign governments, and the threat they pose to U.S. military assets and installations. I would hope so. <laughs> the provision is part of the 2021 Intelligence Authorization Bill. If it passes, the Pentagon will have 180 days to submit a report to Congress. I want to write that report. Can I have access? How do I get involved? Um... Yet, despite the push from senators for intelligence on U.S. adversaries, there are reports that the unit may have discovered some items in its investigation that are more extraterrestrial. May have? Uh, Elizondo is among those who told the New York Times that he believed objects of undetermined origin have been found during the study. He believed. In some cases, an earthly explanation had been found, and even when one isn't, experts say that it does not make an extraterrestrial explanation more likely. Look at these dudes. These dudes, man. Louis Elizondo, pictured left, is a former military intelligence official and the program's previous director. And former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, pictured right, believe extraterrestrial objects have been found... Whoa. I've decided to let the dogs out. Would you like a cookie? Come here. Come here. Hi, Tallulah. Have a cookie. People haven't seen you in a long time. 
Do you believe in extraterrestrials? Do you think that our government is sitting on extraterrestrial like technology? Would you like another cookie? Okay. You can have another cookie. Uh, Gilbert wants a cookie too. Would you like a cookie, Gilbert? Yes. Okay. You, you, you gorgeous specimen of canine hood. How you doing, buddy? No, 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 no. You just get two cookies. That's all you get. You don't get more. You don't get more than two. I know. I know. Just two cookies. Terrible. These dogs. I wasn't even widescreen for that. After looking into this, I came to the conclusion that there were reports, some were substantive, some not so substantive, that there were actual materials that the government and the private sector had in their possession, Reed said to the Times. Okay, look at this. I know. You're going to tell me that I'm a trained, they've trained me well. But, oh, look, I get two of you at once. No one can see them. Look, you got to, you, you, look at that. I didn't realize that you, you both are, okay, okay, okay. You already had your two. Tallulah gets another one. No, 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 no. You're rude. You're a rude dog. But I love you anyway. Yes. No, this is... You got two already. Come on, man. Okay. Um, right. Since you're up here, I think it would be most... No, no, stay. Stay. Sit. Wait. No, 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 no. All right, see, I was going to... Come here. Come on. Come up. I know, you won't come... All right. Since since I only had you in the small frame... Come on up, everybody. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Right. Yes. Now I'm a bad dog owner because I'm giving you way too many treats. Huh? Too many treats. Yeah. I know. No, 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 no. You, you, you were treated out. All right. All right, you guys, come on now. You had too many treats. I know. Oh, give me a kiss, baby. Yeah, okay. You guys go, right? Yes. Oh, no. No, Tallulahs, no. You don't get, no. Uh-uh. No, nope, nope. That was my dog interlude. Yet, despite the push from senators for intelligence on U.S. adversaries, there are reports that the unit may have discovered some items in its investigation that are more extraterrestrial. I love it. Like, may have. <laughs> Come on now. I know. I know. You can't have any more. You, look, go, go follow. Go follow. Go. 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 Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, there's aliens on Earth, and uh, nobody seems to care. <laughs> so according, uh, we couldn't make it ourselves, Eric W. Davis, an astrophysicist who previously worked as a consultant on the program, added some of the items. <laughs> Davis claims he gave a briefing to a Defense Department agency in March about off-world vehicles not made on Earth that have been retrieved. He told the Times he also gave two other briefings on unidentified objects to Senate committees in 2019. No evidence has been produced, however, with some blame placed on the constraints of discussing classified material. There have already been moves this year to improve the level of information provided to the public from the UFO Intelligence Unit, a step which was welcomed by Senator Reid. <laughs> In April this year, the Pentagon released three videos taken by U.S. Navy pilots showing mid-air encounters with unexplained objects. The grainy black and white footage have previously been leaked to the Navy, and they acknowledged were genuine videos. One of the videos shot in November of 20. 2004 and the other two in January of 2015. In one, a weapon sensor operator appears to lose lock on a rapidly moving object, which seconds later suddenly accelerates away to the left and out of view. In another video, which is tracking an object above the clouds, one pilot wonders if it's a drone. The Department of Defense said it was releasing the videos in order to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage that has been circulating was real or whether there or not whether or not there is more videos. 
The aerial phenomenon observed in the videos remain characterized as unidentified, the Pentagon statement said. Retired U.S. Navy pilot David Fravor, who has also been on the Joe Rogan podcast, who saw one of the UFOs in 2004, said the object he saw had been moving erratically. As I got close to it, it rapidly accelerated to the south and disappeared in less than two seconds. This was extremely abrupt, like a ping pong ball bouncing off a wall. It would hit and go the other way. Former Nevada Senator Harry Reid, whose state hosts the top secret Area 51 Air Force facility, welcomed the release of the videos. I'm glad the Pentagon is finally releasing this footage, but it only scratches the surface of research and materials available. The U.S. needs to take a serious scientific look at this and any potential national security implications. The American people deserve to be informed. Well, hey, I mean, if 2020 hasn't gone the way you expected, why shouldn't we have all the evidence we need of extraterrestrial incursions into our airspace? I hope so. I, I, I welcome our extraterrestrial overlords. Bring it on. So anyway, where was I? Yes, today I was just going to read viewer letters. And why not? Because you know who uh, wrote me a letter, and you might be surprised at this, Jeffrey Mao, the chairman himself, has written a letter. Greetings, Rob. I wanted to provide a brief overview and a review of a recent haul that I got from Grindhouse Videos Camp Arrow Sale. This is Grindhouse Video out of Tampa, not to be confused with Grindhouse Releasing, who put out the great Blu-ray of The Swimmer that I had previously written about. So, Grindhouse put out a 50% off of Arrow Titles sale. By the way, I also availed myself of the 50% off Arrow sale, and I have not got my discs yet, but I'm sure they're going to come. Uh, and it's always a good idea to look out for these sales. Family Video does those as well. Arrow's regular prices are kind of high. $30 for their regular discs and even more for prestige titles such as the Robocop Steelbook and Limited Editions. I love Arrow Limited Editions. I have many. Uh, they're, uh, they're probably my favorite of all of the boutique labels. Not to take anything away from anyone, especially not Scream Factory because you know what Scream Factory put out. Oh, let me just tell you. That's right. Scream Factory put out a film I produced, The Hills Run Red, on Blu-ray just about, well, in the middle of June, actually over a month ago. But they did put it out. It has over six and a half hours of special features. And by the way, if you go on over to thedigitalbits.com, they reviewed it. They reviewed this disc. So, hey, what can I tell you? Um, there you go. I, I know. You thought the shameless plugs were... We're done. They're not. They're not. Anyway. Um, since I'd already purchased a number of titles from Arrow, there wasn't a lot left that interested me, so I only picked up Stormy Monday. Damn it. That's something I wanted to get, and I didn't I didn't buy that. While I will write I'll write about that later. They also concurrently had a buy two, get one free sale, so I included Emmanuel in America and Dangerous Cargo from Mondo Macabro and Revenge of the Nerds. To get free shipping, which I had to spend 75 bucks, I threw in the Hammer version of The Mummy with BFFs Cushing and Lee. Emmanuel looked great in its 4K restoration, but was it kind of rough, like really rough? Yep, and fully hardcore. Was it worth getting? Probably, if it's only the Laura Gemser Emmanuel film that I got on disc, as I don't think it's worth it to get any more. Laura replaced Sylvia Crystal and made a lot more Emmanuel movies than she did. Um, by the way... Uh, if you if you want to talk about the future of humanity and uh, why mixed race human beings are the best, look no further than her. My God, amazing. Um, Mondo have been delving into exploitation output from nations less well known, such as Spain and Greece. Dangerous Cargo is a Greek product starring most notably Deborah Shelton of Dallas fame or Deborah Shelton of body double fame. Um, I watched a little bit and realized that I probably should have skipped this one. 
<laughs> Revenge of the Nerds also looked a little rough in terms of its transfer. It's too bad that it wasn't a Shout, Kino, or even Scorpion release, as their work on 1980s films seems to be far better. Revenge is a standard Warner Brothers product, and it shows. I picked up Fraternity Vacation from Scorpion through Amazon, and it immediately looked a lot better than Revenge does. Plus, Fraternity Vacation has a good cast. I'll probably write about it in another letter where I go over a few other purchases that I made. The Hammer Mummy was pretty boring. Unfortunately, my son and I watched the other day, and yeah, not much more I can say about it. However, the best film of this haul has to be Arrow's Stormy Monday. Great. Another movie that I... You, twice you've got me in this letter. This was Mike Figgis' directorial debut. Figgis went on to direct Leaving Las Vegas, Internal Affairs, and Time Code, the film that was mentioned before on this show where the screen shows four simultaneous cuts of action. Stormy Monday is set in Figgis' hometown of Newcastle, England, and if you read Hellblazer, you know what that means. Um, and stars Sean Bean, Melanie Griffith, Tommy Lee Jones, and Sting. Bean plays a local bloke who likes jazz and needs a job, which he finds at Sting's Jazz Club. Sting is under pressure from Jones's crooked businessman to sell his club in a shady land development deal. Griffith is Jones's ex-girlfriend, occasional employee, who falls for Bean. Spoiler alert, Bean does not die at the end. Bean's character, Brandon, aids Sting's Finney in fending off Jones. The film takes place with the backdrop of American Week. Uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know if this was a real thing or not, but it wouldn't have been surprising in those Reagan-Thatcher days. The fact that an American businessman coming over under the guise of wanting to develop the city, but is in fact a crook, only highlights the apparent cynicism on display. When America is described as a benevolent superpower, I had to chuckle. Jones plays his character oddly named Cosmo pretty straight, never devolving into caricature as he tended to do in later films. He displays enough menace, but also dials it back during the scenes where he has to appear like an honest entrepreneur. Bean and Griffith work well together, and while it's all a little convenient how they meet, their relationship has good chemistry. Griffith's character, Kate, was originally intended for Kim Cattrall, and while Cattrall could have played it well, Griffith uses her quirkiness, looks, and voice to good effect here. I feel Cattrall could have brought enough sex appeal to the role, but maybe not enough vulnerability. I haven't seen Sting in many films, but he plays Finney well in a role that had been envisioned for Albert Finney. Hence the name. Sting gets a chance to show off his musical ability, casually playing the upright bass at the club in a scene that I'm sure would give the viewer a chuckle. The other standout aspects of the film are music both in the background and the score, which was also written by Figgis. He also wrote the score for... Um, uh, internal Affairs, which I love. Um, uh, Figgis' love for jazz and Newcastle come through here with photography directed by our man, Roger Deakins. It's not showy as there's not a lot of action, but I like the shot choices as you get to see a lot of the city and it looks prettier than you would have expected. There is one good long take of a conversation between Finney and Cosmo on the bridge. The camera moves in parallel with them as they walk along the bridge, stopping every so often as the sun rises behind them. So that was the one positive from that recent Grindhouse purchase, and I guess it shows you that once you start getting into physical media and you've already bought up all the good stuff, it does become harder and harder to find those lesser and well-known titles. Those hidden gems. They're out there, but you have to dig more, and sometimes you come up empty-handed. I think after all the stuff that I have on order and pre-order, I'll be more selective and probably wait for only a special release or a good sale to come along. Like, for example, the one where I got Arrow's Ronin for five bucks. That disc is the best, by the way. Five bucks. Now, that was a rare steal, and those deals don't come along very often, but my advice is to keep your eyes out there and for those and to watch social media. Also, I forget this one sometimes, too. If you find a good price for a disc on either the direct site or a reseller, check Amazon. I bought two Paul Nashie discs from Mondo Direct and later noticed that Amazon had them for like a dollar or two less. Luckily, it wasn't much below what I paid, but it reminded me to always check Amazon first. You definitely don't want to kick yourself later. I don't want to be tempted by sales and end up buying stuff only to find out that I don't like the film or not even end up watching it. Well... Uh, you know what, Jeffrey? I want to see your collection based on what you're buying. I'm sure you have some uh, some gems. Well, that's all I have today. I'll write more about the other stuff that I'll watch later. Thanks, Jeff. Well, Jeff, thank you. Um, 
as everyone knows, I'm a huge fan of physical media. I've been rearranging my whole collection myself. I got more shelves. I actually, you know what I got today? Um, oh, they're over there. I actually got letters, like little plastic placards that have letters on them, like an A and a B and a C, to, <laughs> to put in my collection. <laughs> I don't know why. It was just one of those stupid things on Amazon that popped up. I'm like, ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy these. <laughs> and I did. It makes me feel like I'm 72 years old, but still cool nonetheless. Um, guess who's here? Omar. Omar is here. Omar94. Hi, Rob. Just curious. Since there used to be a time when movies would have tie-in songs, if there are tie-in songs you like to movies that do not have the best reviews to them, in that the movie is not that well-liked, but the tie-in song is actually quite good, for me, there are two tie-in songs I like in particular, despite the movies not being well-received. The first is Irene Cara's What a Feeling from the 1983 movie Flashdance. The second is the Beach Boys' Kokomo from Cocktail. Thanks, live long and prosper. First of all, who doesn't like Flashdance? Take your passion and make it happen. You know, you got to Flashdance your life up, son. I love Flashdance. Uh, and I love that song. Uh, I first became aware of Irene Cara in the movie Fame, in Alan Parker's Fame, where she's actually a character. I love Alan Parker's Fame. Oh, what a feeling. Uh, it's just called Fame, not Oh, what a feeling. Um, and I like Irene Cara. She's great. So I love that song. And uh, Kokomo, who doesn't like Cocktail? Cocktail is not a good movie. It's not a good movie. It, it, it ends in a, in a ridiculous fashion. But I like it. I like it. It's probably the least of all of Tom Cruise's movies. I mean, not good. Not a big fan. But the song, I guess that's okay. I mean, I'd have to go, I think my favorite song written specifically for a movie, I'm going to go with Another Way to Die. I mean, Jack White and Alicia Keys from the very underrated Bond film Quantum of Solace. I love that song. Everyone seems to dislike it. I don't get it. I don't understand. Why don't people like that song? Another Way to Die. What a vibe that song has, man. It's I, I love everything about it. Um, uh, but th that's a good question. I mean, songs that are actually written for movies and the movie isn't that good. Um, some people don't like Legend, another Tom Cruise movie. But I love the Brian Ferry song, Is Your Love Strong Enough? Just one step at a time. I love that song. Actually, I love the movie, so... I don't know if that really fits in, but there you go. That's that, that's what uh, that's the first thing that came to my mind. So we'll see. And would you guys believe it if I told you that Ian Samuels wrote a letter? He did. Uh, Rob and fellow Rob observationists, way back in 1960, when life was black and white, and there was an attempt to have a James Bond type TV series. They even had an Ian, Fl Ian Fleming working on it, but he pulled out some time before the series went into production. Anyway, it was called Danger Man. Danger Man, or as it was known in the U.S., Secret Agent, and it was known in other parts of the world as Destination Danger or John Drake. Patrick McGowan starred as the main character, John Drake, which is why it was called John Drake in some places. John Drake is a British spy, but unlike Bond, he works for NATO, or at least that's how it started. He was based out of New York and had missions in Africa, Latin America, and the Far East. Unlike Bond, he rarely used a gun and didn't have a run of one-night stands. Many episodes started with a voiceover with John Drake saying, Every government has its secret service branch. America, CIA, France, uh, Dream Bureau, England, MI5, NATO also has its own. A messy job? Well, that's when they usually call me on, or someone like me. And yes, my name is Drake, John Drake. In episode one, it's revealed that he is Irish-American. After the first season, the American partner pulled its funding. So after a break, the series returned, but the character was changed. John Drake became English and worked for the British government for MI9. The pilot episode, which was called View from the Villa, was set in Italy and was written by Brian Clemens, who would go on to create The Avengers. That's The Avengers with John Steed and Emma Peel, not The Avengers with Iron Man. Much of the exterior shots were filmed in Port Marion in North Wales, which would be a location of the village in The Prisoner. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm doing with Az a, we're going to do another episode next week, where we're going to look at all 17 episodes of The Prisoner. We're going to review each episode on each show, and uh, this is uh, all about John Drake, or is it? The title sequence to The Prisoner, we see Patrick McGowan as an unnamed secret agent. Poison gas is pumped. Oh, you're talking about, um, hang on, let me go back. Uh, unfortunately, American audiences didn't get to see them. Oh, I'm, I'm missing a, pardon me. Uh, let me go back. I've missed part of your letter. A fourth and final season consisted of just two episodes called Kuroshi and Shindashima, the only two episodes that were filmed in color. They were broadcast in black and white, but combined a color format for a limited cinema release across Europe. Unfortunately, American audiences didn't get to see them. The episode Kuroshi eventually appeared on a 2000 release DVD set. Patrick McGowan left the project to begin work on the spin-off series The Prisoner, but delays in production led to Kuroshi and Shindashima were shown in the slot where The Prisoner was supposed to start. In the title sequence of The Prisoner, we see Patrick McGowan as an unnamed secret agent. Poison gas is pumped into his London flat and he wakes up in the village. Officially, the agent McGowan plays is unnamed, but drives the same Lotus 7 sports car and has the same London flat as John Drake. So unofficially, many who watched Danger Man and followed McGowan onto the series chose to believe that McGowan was playing the same character and that The Prisoner was a sequel series to Danger Man, but this was never made official. Although an alternate ending for the series was written when it was revealed the mysterious number one is revealed to be an agent named John Drake, who had devised the concept of the village out of concern of how to deal with agents who had retired but could still be considered a security risk. It is then revealed that number six is in fact John Drake, who has chosen to retire. Well, there you go. Danger Man and the Prisoner and how they were supposed to be linked and how fans chose to believe they were anyway. That's from Ian Samuels. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, very, uh, very um, timely, considering um, that I'm doing a show talking about that very thing. Stubble McShave is here. Stubble says, hi, Rob. Your show Wednesday about the start of Comic-Con made me think of what gets lost when things go mainstream. Sometimes the most enthusiastic fans are often the first casualties of when niche things go big. A book series that I'm very enthusiastic about... Wait a minute. Hang on a second, Stubble. Are you enthusiastic about a certain book series? Come on, man. Really? Anyway. Sometimes the most enthusiastic fans are often the first casualties of when niche things go big. A book series that I'm very enthusiastic about is on the verge of going mainstream with a TV series on Amazon, which has been described as a mega-budget TV series, and there's already been some casualties. About 10 years ago, a young couple who were dedicated fans started a company to sell t-shirts, jewelry, and other types of merchandise for the book series. They acquired the rights and started to produce some high-quality stuff. During one of the annual conventions dedicated to the book series, the guy went on stage and proposed to his girl, and they've been married for a number of years now. They were always the biggest fans and created some of your typical t-shirts and jewelry, but they also had deep cut products. I didn't know them personally, but they were well known to me and the community. When Amazon acquired the rights to the series, they also got all the merchandising rights. So this company that's been heavily dedicated to this brand of merchandise for 10 years lost the rights to produce more merch. I understand all the reasoning for that, and it will go mainstream. The small company wouldn't be able to keep up with all the merchandise demands that will happen. I just feel sorry for these dedicated fans that they had a strong connection to the community getting sidelined from their business that they've been de developing for 10 years. The same is true for artists that have been doing artwork for calendars, playing cards, and other types of merch. They've lost their contracts, too. I know that some of them may be rehired by Amazon when it's time to start producing artwork and stuff like that. They have certainly shown their talents on social media in the hopes of being picked up. I've always known that there's always a trade-off when things go mainstream, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. Rob... Do you have any other examples of this type of grassroots enthusiasts being sidelined by big business when genre IPs are going big? Stubble, I can honestly say that in my past, I've never been involved with anything remotely similar to what you're describing. P. 
P.S. Here's a link to illustrator Ariel Burgess's site on her Wheel of Time artwork. Check it out. It's really good. Well, I don't think I'll be demonetized for sharing this link, but I'm going to share it right now. There you go. Check out her artwork. Um, no, I, I mean, look, I think that's always a bummer. And uh, honestly, I, w I would think if, if I, let's say I was Amazon and I was buying an IP like Wheel of Time, which is what we're talking about, um, I would go hire those people. I mean, what more do you want to promote a product than enthusiastic fans who are making products simply because they loved it? Now, I get it. You have to protect your IP and the money you're investing. But still, you know, those fans, there's, they're, the, the, they're very valuable. That kind of a fan base is very, very valuable. And they could tell you a lot about how to merchandise things. And I think what's really interesting is in our streaming era, in this the, the era of streaming, you don't see a lot of merchandise being made by streaming services. Um, I don't know why that is, but I would think that they would want more and more of that. Um, you never know. Um this letter comes from Guy Bottledorn. Oh, you know what? Well, I'll read this. Hello, Mr. Burnett. Hi, Rob. Hope you don't mind me addressing you on a first-name basis. No, I don't. Since the COVID adventure started, I spend a lot of my time on the net, and I close my day listening to Rob's observations and Eliza views, but only if I've seen the film. If I hadn't, i try to watch it ASAP and then watch both of your takes on it. I just adore the banter between you two. Thank you so much for reading my Dune letter on your channel. It was amazing and a first for me. I just wrote in on the French release because we clearly have the same mindset on movies and series, especially when it comes to physical media. We clearly park our shuttles in the same shuttle or in the same Blu-ray shop. By the way, may I compliment you on the perfect pronunciation of my last name? I live in Antwerp, Flanders, and our last names are rather tricky to pronounce, but you nailed it. Bottledorn. I hope I got it right. On a completely different topic, I would like to hear your thoughts on a personal pet theory of mine on the Star Wars universe. It is a combination of, of the opening lines and Stephen Hawking's Big Bang Theory. Let's start with Stephen. Our universe was at its start a minuscule amount of matter that has expanded with a big bang into the enormous universe we live in now. Current science proves that it keeps expanding and that all the Milky Ways and all of the other star systems are getting further away from each other. Now, look at the opening lines of Star Wars, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Well, here's my theory, and the probably unconsciously genius of Mr. Lucas. If you take these lines literally, we have to reverse the Big Bang Theory. I mean, if we're expanding as time goes forward, if you reverse time and go back into the past, our universe is shrimping. In other words, even if we would have the ability to travel in light speed now as in Star Wars, visiting another star system is impossible at this moment. It simply would take too long, like Anara, my favorite Swedish science fiction film. But a long time ago, the star systems would be much closer to each, so close that interstellar travel was perfectly possible at light speed. I never read or heard this little theory anywhere. What do you think about it? Is it far-fetched? Yeah, maybe. But I think it's a, sound, it's a sound one, and it adds a lot to the verisimilitude of Star Wars, methinks. But what is our Viceroy's take on it? Have an even better day, says Guy Bottledorn. Uh, you know, or bo bottle, it, it's Bottledorn? Dorn? Guy Bottledorn. Um, here's the thing, uh, here's the thing, guy, uh, well, Star Wars only takes place in one galaxy, so the fact that they're, they're really, I mean, even the Outer Rim territories, I, I, I like that idea, but is the galaxy smaller? Is it more compact? I mean, if the galaxies were closer together because they haven't expanded that far, would the galaxy itself be smaller? It, does it all contract on itself, or would just galaxies be closer together? So I think that's an interesting... I've never thought of that before, but it's interesting, but um, if the galaxy is still the same, 
and it hasn't shrunk, it still would take the same amount of time to go through the uh, go between stars. I don't know. It's interesting to contemplate. Uh, I don't know the answer. No man can say, I guess. I don't know. Um, let's see what you guys are saying. What are you saying out there in chat land? Uh, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, wow, there's a lot of people here. There's a lot of people. Who have been, I, I, wow. Eric Gant sends in a tip and says, My schedule prevents me from catching the live show, but I'm tipping in to ask which of the following Star Trek two-part episodes do you like most and why? The Menagerie? Unification, Broken Bow, The Way of the Warrior, or Scorpion. Well, since you asked me those, uh, the Menagerie wins hands down. Um, before anyone had ever seen The Cage, the Menagerie was the one of the most fascinating. I mean, uh, Star Trek, canonical Star Trek really began with the Menagerie because it offered or it posited, it showed us that the Enterprise had a history, that Spock had a history. The Enterprise has a history where Kirk was not in command. And it, first of all, the whole story of the cage, the Talosians and Talos IV and Susan Oliver. I mean, in my mind, as much as my uh, view of, of women was shaped by classic Star Trek, I think Susan Oliver's Vena is, is the pinnacle of, of Star Trek women. And uh, maybe because we saw her in a bunch of different... I mean, let's face it. She was the first green girl. I mean, nice place you got here, Mr. Pike. So all day and every day, it's the menagerie. Now, I would say you didn't ask me about the two-parters, but there are two Star Trek two-parters you didn't list here that I love. Chain of Command, parts one and two, and in, in Purgatory Shadow and by Inferno's Light from Deep Space Nine. Those are those I, I love those. Um, Willow sent in a tip yesterday and she says, I apologized if you got demonetized yesterday. It just really bothered me when I was watching Game of Thrones. Well, as you all know, if you've come to the show before, Willow wanted to talk about Bush. Bush, pubic Bush, uh, in movies and TV. And I, I didn't get demonetized, so that was okay. I think talking about uh, and, and I explained how over the course of my life, Bush has come and gone. And, uh, so to speak, so no, Willow, I didn't get demonetized, but I, you know, I'm with you hundred percent. Willow, uh, sent in a tip today and says, I liked the twist at the end of DS9's whispers, but do you think it's unethical to kill the O'Brien clone? He hasn't done anything wrong at that point, And he's a sentient being with all the memories and personalities of the original clones or people too. Star Trek does not have a great track record when dealing with clones. And I think not a lot of people do. Um, for one, uh, Star Trek Nemesis, the big bad is a clone of Picard, but they don't even understand what that means. A clone does not have your memories or experiences. It just has your ge genetic material. And if you're raised, you don't have any, you can't feel uh, the, the feelings of, of, of the person you've been cloned from. All that's just gobbledygook. But I do believe in the rights of clones. Clones are people too. Just because you've been cloned, that person is a human being, an individual. They deserve all the rights that any other individual has. But we are fascinated by this idea. Obviously, we've never let me go as a favorite film of mine, where clones in that in that movie are are bred simply to be organ banks for their original their originals. And I, 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 that is so strange to me, although that movie is about how does society cope. The idea, a, a clone, even replicants, you know, replicants are manufactured people, but they're still people. They're still organic beings. Yes, they have a four-year lifespan, but they're still, and, and this idea that they wouldn't be is so weird. They keep trying to foist this idea that clones or manufactured people or are somehow not human. I don't understand this. I don't I don't get the idea that why would you think they're not? But they keep trying to push that idea on us. Look, man, if if, if there's a human being, it doesn't matter where where that human being came from. They're a human being, whether they're cloned or not. 
And uh, if they're cloned, they were actually manufactured, so they're even more precious, I would imagine. But yes, clones are people too. 100%. I, I did think it was unethical to kill the O'Brien clone. I still do. Reggie L. sends in a tip and says, My friend is an aspiring director. He dragged me into being his editor. He wants to edit projects without any notes or looking at his scripts. Being on the more technical side, how effective having discipline in place? Well, I don't know quite what you're asking, but uh, as a film editor myself, I have a script usually, especially when I'm going through the film for the first time, I have a script up on my screen a lot of the time when I'm editing, so I can refer back to it. As a matter of fact, a good editor usually works off the script supervisor's notes. So you're not only looking at a script, you're looking at the script the scripties notes uh, to tell you about takes, circle takes, that kind of thing. So um, I think having that kind of discipline is important. Although there are some people that are like, you know what, it doesn't matter what was on the page. It only matters what we have. And I will say sometimes uh, they didn't get something. Some line might not be covered properly. It can be annoying. You're like, why didn't you shoot this? We don't know. Uh, Lancelot Narian sends in a tip and says, glad you like my Harry and Cubby shirt. Okay, Lancelot uh, on Twitter posted a t-shirt that he has that says Albert Broccoli and, and Harry Saltzman uh, present, and it's from the beginning of a James Bond film. I had it made by a company here in the UK called Red Molotov. They also made my Desilu shirt and my favorite one, which screams, Not now, Madeline. Ask them nicely, and maybe they'll do one for you, too. Well, I, I want one of those shirts. Now, based on what you what what I saw, I think it can only be one of two movies. It, it, it either is Dr. No or it's from Russia with Love. And if I had to guess, I think it's from Russia with Love because... I think the and in Dr. No is different. I, 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 I'm not looking at the actual image right now, but I would say from Russia with Love, that would be my guess. Because the others, it, it's, it, it, it looks different. Those are in the first two Bond films, it looked a certain way, but when you get to Goldfinger, then they stacked their uh, credits. They were, they were different. Um, Lancelot says, P.S., which text is the film from? Well, there, I, that's my guess, from Russia with Love. Jordy Lyons, moderator. Can I just say it was an honor to moderate for this fine group and yourself. This is just a small token of my thanks. Well, Jordy, thank you. Hope all is well with your family and in your world. Uh, Stubble McShave says, uh, The Wheel of Time cast is hosting a 24-hour Wheel of Time podcast-a-thon on their YouTube page at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It features 18 different Wheel of Time podcasts and YouTube channels supporting the Cyber Smile Foundation, a nonprofit versus cyber bullying. Uh, well, okay, let me, uh, you put a link, and I will put the link into the live chat, which I'm going to do. So uh, here you go. I'm going to say not now, Madeline, my whole, the, the, all day long. So thanks for that, Stubble. Emil Johansson is here, sends in a super chat and says, there's a documentary on Netflix about the mafia. It's great. I've heard about that, the mafia in the New York, in New York. Can't wait to see it. Uh, Lord Toth sends in a super chat and says, mac and cheese with sweet Aussie, Shira Aussie Shiraz or Pinot Grigio. Look, man, I love like Penfold Shiraz. I'm, I'm down. Torin Atkinson sends in a super chat and says, send your notes on the Duel of the Fates script. I'll board and make an automatic, add voice acting, and we'll be sued out of existence. Wouldn't it be glorious? Yeah, man, I'll send you the Duel of the Fates script if you want. I'll give you notes. I'll give you shot, shot lists. Starry-Eyed Girl. Starry-Eyed Girl, by the way, delightful woman who I was on a podcast with yesterday. Uh, her 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 voice is to die for. It's like melted butter. It's amazing. Uh, nothing like that kind of an accent. She was amazing. Starry-eyed girl says, 
Hello, Rob. I was so focused on Star Trek yesterday that I forgot to ask you about the extras you did for The Lord of the Rings. How much creative input did you have on those, and what was your favorite? You also mentioned interviewing Christopher Lee. How was that? Well, um, so when we when we were working on The Lord of the Rings Extended Edition Special Features, we were assigned to different topics. And... Uh, during fellowship, I didn't have a lot to do. I just did one. Oh, no, I did two pieces. I did a piece on digital grading and a piece on editorial because I was working on Tron. With uh, Two Towers, I did about 40% of the interviews, and so I was living in New Zealand for a long time, and I only did the editorial piece because that was the only piece I cut because I was doing interviews the whole time, which was awesome. So I was given pretty much carte blanche, although I'll... I'll say I'll tell I'll tell you guys this. Um, so, Peter Jackson, I guess we can talk about this. Can I? I can talk about this because why not? It was a long time ago. Basically, there were tax laws that Peter Jackson had changed uh, based on the production of that movie, and they had to show various cuts. And when they showed, like when I saw Return of the King. I guess it was the version they showed to the tax board and it had to have been like 80% of the way there. It was about 20% of the way there. So there was a weird issue with the tax board of New Zealand and making Lord of the Rings. I mean, come on, how much money did Lord of the Rings bring in and, and afterwards in terms of tourism, whatever it was. I mean, it was ridiculous that there was a problem. But when I was cutting my piece on the two towers, the editorial piece, there was a, a new line lawyer who came in one day and just sat there quietly and I had to show him the piece because the idea of the pickups that were being done, like normally you do a couple days, like the Lord of the Rings movies had like 60 days of pickups, which is like making a whole new movie because that's how much they changed. But the the it was weird. So... I had carte blanche to do whatever I want with my digital grading and editorial pieces. Michael would look at them, Michael Pellerin, whose company it was, and he was he was the empresario of all this, and he would give notes. But for the most part, like I was able to start from scratch and, and tell whatever story I wanted to tell. So it was pretty cool. And when I was interviewing people, like you asked about Christopher Lee, for whatever reason, nobody wanted to go interview Christopher Lee. I guess people were scared. I'm like, hell yes, I want to go interview Christopher Lee. Are you kidding me? I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again since you asked. So when I interviewed Christopher Lee, it was shortly before Attack of the Clones came out. I want to say it was it was, it was was in 2000, maybe late 2001, or maybe it was in 2000. I'm not sure. So uh, we, we get it. When you interview people especially after the fact, you a lot of the time you'll do it in a hotel room because you don't want to go to their house if they're celebrities. So they want to feel safe. So you rent a nice suite. You you bring in food and, and hair and makeup people. So I we got a suite at the Dorchester Hotel, which is a very swanky hotel in London, which I had never been to. And I, I should have stayed in the room, but I didn't. I was staying at St. Martin's Lane, which is another great hotel, an Eden Schrager Hotel that I love. Um which I've stayed at multiple times, but, um, so we were at the Dorchester hotel and Christopher Lee came in and I, everyone was scared. So I went, you know, I went to interview him and, uh, it was, we, we did a five hour interview. It was the, it was one of the most fun interviews of my life. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people for various movies, but I think my favorite interview I ever did was Christopher Lee. And we, we talked for five hours. It was amazing. And I'll, I'll tell you the story he, he told me. And he was like, you know, I'm in the new Star Wars film. I, I'm like, yes, yes, I, I know. And he says, he said to me, he goes, my great friend, Peter Cushing, rest in peace. My great friend was in the first Star Wars movie. And I said, yes, I, I know. And he goes, you know, when I saw that film for the first time, I... I called him on the phone and I said, Peter, you were you were just terrible to that princess, just awful. Why did you have to treat her so badly? And by the way, what exactly is a grand moth? 
And then he threw back his head and chortled. <laughs> and and I was laughing. I was laughing too. What is a Grand Moff? I don't know. And uh, I thought that was very funny. So I asked him. I said, uh, well, Mr. Lee, uh, if, 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 if Peter Cushing were alive today and he was able to go see Attack of the Clones, what do you think he would say to you after he saw it? And Christopher Lee got thoughtful and he said, well, I suppose he'd want to know what a Dooku was now, wouldn't he? And I laughed because I thought that was pretty damn funny. Um, and I did, by the way, I did send that bit of tape because we didn't use it up to Lucasfilm, but I think it, it disappeared. We, um, we uh, never saw it again. But uh, that was funny. That is a true story. Uh, Nick Parrish sends in a tip. And says, good Friday, Rob. I found another interesting news article on AMC that might surprise you. So apparently, per the New York Post and the Wall Street Journal, AMC's creditors are now trying to outdo each other on who can offer AMC the best financing deal. Interesting. Creditors who don't like Silver Lake's deal are now flashing multiple deals at AMC. Rob, I never thought a company that everyone thought was going bankrupt would now have creditors in a battle royale who can impress AMC with the best rescue deal. Well, you know, <clears throat> that doesn't surprise me because who doesn't love movies? I mean, eventually, if they can survive this, AMC, movie theaters, movie theater chains are going to come out of this okay. And my God, 2021 might be the best year ever for movies. Ever. I mean, and now we're getting, uh, my God, Justice for Han and a Top Gun sequel in 2021. Uh, the So far, Dune... And No Time to Die have not been moved. No Time to Die off its November date, but I'll bet it's going to get moved. Can you imagine? We're going to get what we're going to a bevy of, of wonders in 2021. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Supreme Joseph sends in a super chat and says, Where is Kirk and what rank does he hold during the new up-and-coming Pike series? Well, if, if Kirk is going to be in it at all, he's either he's got to be either a cadet at Starfleet Academy or he's an ensign on the Farragut, serving under Captain Garavik, uh, as we learn about in the second season episode, Obsession. So I would say that is, uh, that's it. <clears throat> Bunyan Snipe sends in a tip and says, I emailed the Star Citizen package to your thebrunetwork.net address. I got it. And thank you so much. You know who's going to be playing a little Star Citizen? That's right, this guy right here. And you know what I'm going to be doing when I play it? I'm going to be hopefully eating more of this delightful mac and cheese. Oh, my God. Can we talk about it some more? So good. Oh, my God. Thank you, Kaz Graphics. Echo Base Network. Uh, how are you? How are you guys doing? Echo Base Network sends in a super chat and says, Has there, is there a better action horror movie than Aliens? Probably not. Probably not. It's pretty damn good. Uh, it doesn't get much better. Trent sends in a tip and says, Rob, I'm glad you and Elizabeth talked about Point Break. One of my favorite movies I've ever seen. Two guys who love each other as bros but are on totally different paths hits home with me. Yo, Johnny, see you in the next life. Best line in the movie. 10 out of 10. For those of you who've never watched Whining About Movies, I... I, I okay. So Wednesday would have been preview night at Comic-Con. And some of my good friends started a Zoom chat where instead of drinking at the Marriott bar at 5 o'clock every day we during Comic-Con, so Wednesday, Thursday, tonight, Saturday, and Sunday, we uh, meet and drink together virtually. So before I did Whining About Movies on Wednesday, I drank whiskey for the first time in months. And I was lit. If you watch Whining About Movies, the Point Break episode, I am... I, I'll admit it, not since I used to do, um, uh, what was it called, <laughs> you know, where I would drink on, uh, on uh, uh, I, why am I drawing a blank uh, uh, on the title of my own show, um, but I, I was so hammered when I was on the Point Break show, and of course, we drink a bottle of wine, so I was even more hammered, I could barely speak, I can't believe I got through the episode, but uh, apparently... Uh, Elizabeth, I mean, 
eviscerated Point Break because people are still complaining about it. But it was hilarious. So I'm glad that we did a movie you liked. Tonight, by the way, we're doing Sing Street. Perhaps we will solve the riddle of the model. Tune in tonight uh, at... at uh, Eight o'clock, maybe seven. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Uh, and find out if you haven't seen Sing Street. What a great movie! Another movie that you watch and it just makes you want to go to Ireland. So yeah, Sing Street. We're talking about tonight. And um, yeah, Lancelot Narion sends in a tip and says, "Have you heard No Good uh, No Good About Goodbye by Shirley Bassey?" Yes. Written by David Arnold and Don Black. was going to be for Quantum of Solace, but was finished after the film. It is amazing. I don't like the Jack White and Alicia Keys track. It's wrong. Cornell song, so much better. It's not wrong. Another Way to Die is awesome. I do like the Shirley Bassey song. I don't know why they didn't include it, uh, but I do like it. Uh, Jeffrey Mao sends in a tip and says, I bought Ronin from MVD, MVD, MVDshop.com, who are actually located quite close to me, about a half an hour drive away in Pottstown, PA. Just check their website, and they have a COVID outbreak in their warehouse. If anyone can, help them out. Well, everybody, go to MVD, uh, MVD, MVDshop.com and go buy something from them. Although, if they have a COVID outbreak in their warehouse, maybe you shouldn't order from them. <laughs> but uh, I like them. I know that company. They're good. Uh, Nathan Taylor sends in a super chat and says, what are some of your favorite Kevin Bacon movies? Ooh, that's a good question. My f First of all, whenever I think Kevin Bacon, I think Footloose because I got to cut loose. Uh, I love Footloose. I'm, I'm not the remake. I like the original Kevin Bacon Footloose. Also, here's a deep cut from Kevin Bacon's career. Animal House. I don't want to see, you know, I don't want to see him, you know, pushy. Yes, Kevin Bacon is in Animal House. Uh, that's another favorite Kevin Bacon movie of mine. I think Peak Bacon is Flatliners. That's a great Kevin Bacon performance. Hollow Man, Paul Verhoeven's Hollow Man, although not my favorite of his films, but that's a good uh, that's a good Kevin Bacon. A Few Good Men, even though he's in a supporting role. Gotta love Kevin Bacon and A Few Good Men. Um, so there you go. That was off the top of my head. Um, uh, wow, Lancelot Narian sends, Sorry, babe, it's not from Russia with Love. The credit there was projected onto the body of a belly dancer. No. No. I took the shot from Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Red Molotov had to reconstruct it and print it for me. Oh. No, but I'm telling you, man. Nope, nope, nope. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Let's let's see. Uh well, obviously you you already answered your own question. So, uh but 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 I will say from hang on opening credits. Let's see. Um and I'm going to because now I could be wrong. Ah uh, 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 hang on. Whoa. Let me just say right here. I took a picture. Watch. I'm going to put it up. I'm going to put it up. Just so you can see it. And I, I, you know, you can understand why I would have thought this. Because every other. I, I mean, I didn't. You know what? Our Majesty's Secret Service. All right. Look. Look at this. Just so you know, look, that is from the beginning of From Russia With Love. So, you know, and Dr. No's like this too. Although the and in Dr. No is, is more stylized. I didn't, I, you know what? Uh, on a, hang on a second. Wait a minute. I'm going to check. I'm going to, uh, let's see. Unless it's the very beginning of the movie. Let's see. I'm looking. As uh, how weird this Spanish commercial, uh, playing. Uh, it wouldn't let me zip through the ad. This never happened to the other fellow. Oh, it doesn't say Harry Saltzman and Albert Broccoli. Maybe you got that from the very beginning of the movie. 
like at the very beginning before the scene plays. All right, I stand corrected. But just so you know, that's when that's why I thought from Rush with Love. Okay, I believe you. Uh, Jared uh, <laughs> Mananin is here, and you haven't been here in a while. Hello, Jared. Thank you for uh, sending in a tip. Hi, Rob. I just wanted to tell you my tabletop RPG book, World of Elysia, was just published. So I was wondering if I could send you the PDF version as a gift. Book will also go to printing next Monday, which I can send you when it arrives from printing. Yes, please do. I would love that. Uh, by the way, congratulations. That's a great accomplishment. That's amazing. Uh, Stubble McShave says, I think there are more similarities between Jaws and Jurassic Park then there are differences. Uh, you might be right about that. Uh, you could be. Um, we shall see. I don't. I don't actually know if that's true or not. Uh, Lubna Khan. Lubna Khan wrote a letter. Um, ooh, you know what? I, Lubna Khan's letter is going to be saved for tonight on Elizabeth's whining about movies. So uh, there you go. I'm not going to read that one. Omar94 sends in a letter, another one, and says, I wanted to give you, your moderators, and the viewers a movie recommendation, which I like and I think is underappreciated. So here it goes. My movie recommendation is a 1942 crime thriller called All Through the Night. It stars Humphrey Bogart, Conrad Veidt, and Peter Lorre. Wow, all of which were in Casablanca. While it is a crime thriller... There are some moments of slapstick comedy. However, I thought the slapstick worked where it was placed in the story rather than it being forced or coming out of nowhere. Thanks and live long and prosper, says Omar94. Well, thank you, Omar. I appreciate that too. Uh, Gabriel Ellis is here. Uh, hi, Rob and members of the Post Geek Singularity and greetings from Warsaw. All right. Uh, I wanted to get your take on a few topics relating to the long-term effects of the COVID situation. For one, streaming services and TV programs still have an obvious advantage over cinema, but for how long? How much content have Netflix, HBO, Amazon, and the others produced prior to COVID so they can slowly roll it out and satisfy our needs for high-quality material? How long does it take until eventually even this source dries out and we're left with uh, home broadcasts, late night shows, and podcasts. When will we start to see large scale movies and series content produced after COVID in 2022? The other topic I'm interested in is the effect on cultures internationally when the U.S. produces so much less movie and TV content that defines behavioral scripts. I would argue that over the decades, the U.S. film industry has successfully created archetypes of what is considered strong, successful, cool, quirky, or sensitive. For example, in reality, people don't cry like in movies, yet movie crying seems more real. Also, relationship issues on the screen are not realistic. They're condensed and drive a plot, yet we have them at the back of our minds as blueprints when we have real arguments which don't lead to a resolution. Real mobsters fell in love and imitated the archetypical Don Corleone. And Tarantino helped crafting a new funny yet deadly kind of cool that people like to imitate in conversations. These kinds of blueprints reverberated through cultures around the globe. What an, this is a very interesting uh, letter. These kinds of blueprints uh, reverberated through cultures around the globe, inspiring English, Indian, German, or French variations. Now, granted, for a longer time now, also music and social media and comedy have increased their influence on what is perceived cool and attractive around the globe, but I would argue they can't fully replace the complexity of character development mesmerizing us in films and TV shows. So I wonder, what will the effect be in both the U.S. and internationally when the decrease of new material results in less commonly shared scripts to structure our self-image, our self-development, and our relationships? My guess is that people will look for other sources for updates, but I don't know where. Interested in your thoughts and reflections, and thanks for reading the letter. Gabriel Ellis, or Gabriel. Um... What a fascinating letter. What, a, what an interesting question. Um, I, look, I think this COVID situation and our uh, America's response to it is, is going to diminish our stature in the eyes of pretty much the entire rest of the planet. 
are Americans cool anymore or are we just stupid idiots? Um, we don't look good. It's not a good look. Uh, I think this is going to be the first time that all of... I think everything wrong with American society has been laid bare for the world to see based on this COVID-19 epidemic, uh, the pandemic. And I don't know if anyone's going to be emulating Americans anytime soon because any of the coolness, the cool factor that we might have had has been laid bare as a, 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 it's not real. I mean, our response to this pandemic has been abhorrent. Uh, uh, It's terrible. And so I don't know. But that said, I still love America. I love being an American. It's it's good. But um, I think, I think it's going to look a lot of the streaming shows, like even the animated series that I've been working on. Uh, there's 14 episodes that have essentially been, uh, that are in various states of completion and it's only an eight, uh, episode season. So we're on the downside of season two already. So there's a lot of shows. I mean, the, the, the one thing about Netflix is, you know, they drop all their shows at once. So they're, they probably have a backlog of shows that have already been shot. But I definitely think we're going to reach a point where there is not going to be new content. It's going to be content like this, I guess. Uh, it's it's problematic. It's going to be problematic. Um, and I, I it's going to be. I don't know what's going to happen. I know that <laughs> I know that 2021 is going to be a bang up year for movies. As all the movies that were going to come out this year keep getting pushed. I mean, today Top Gun Maverick is gone. Quiet Place Two is gone. Mulan is gone. Uh, so all going into 2021, uh, so it's going to be a good year for films, but yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I don't know, I don't know where we're going to be, to be honest. Uh, I don't know. We shall see. Uh, Raymond Starkey sends in a letter and says, long time, first time. I'm not good at letter writing. But I had to send my disgust at the Netflix show Cursed. As an Englishman, I find it offensive that the cultural appropriation of one King Arthur and race flipping him is okay. To me, this is about as culturally appropriate as to race flip Martin Luther King. Something none of us wishes to see. (laughs) Well, Raymond, uh, I have not seen Cursed. I've heard about it. I love me some King Arthur. Uh, if you ever read Mike Barr's comic series, Camelot 3000, they gender flipped one of the knights. And again, you know, um, I, I don't necessarily mind that. You know, if, if uh, I, I, can, I can see, I can understand, but, but when, I, when I see things like that, I just, I go with the flow. You know, when they made Nick Fury black in the Ultimates universe. I didn't have a problem with it. I'm like, plus he was written really well. I liked the Ultimates version of Nick Fury. And I, I get it. I understand where you're coming from. But I would go and say, okay, well, here's a here's a different, a modern adaptation or a modern look at uh, at King Arthur. And they, they've, they've uh, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, but you know, I mean, the Western world, Jesus Christ probably didn't look anything like he's been depicted in Western, uh, in our in our our stained glass windows. I mean, he was Middle Eastern. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe if King Arthur was a real dude, he was, he was, a, he was Moorish. I don't know. But I, I, I feel your pain. I know where you're coming from. But I would, I would say, okay, this is a, t- to me, it's just a different take on the Arthurian mythos, and they've been so redone over the years. I would say, do you enjoy the show? Is the show good? I haven't seen it, so I can't speak to it. But I would try and love it for what it is. And uh, uh, I don't. I I never thought that because you know King Arthur basically is is mythological. But uh, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. But, you know, I, I think I would, I, I, I want to see the show. But I think it'd be cool. The, the real question is, is the fact that King Arthur has been, um, 
Uh, you're, I would assume he's black because I haven't seen the version of I haven't seen what you're talking about. Did they did they make that a plot point or did they just do it for casting? Like you know, if you get someone like Idris Elba, to, if you had Idris Elba play King Arthur, I'm like I wouldn't question it at all. I mean that'd be a badass. I would love to see that, but I I don't know anything about the show, so um, I'd say go with it. You know, uh, just watch it for its own sake, and um, yeah, and remember. You can always fall back on Excalibur, which a lot of Arthurian people don't like. I like it. You've got, what, First Night? There's uh, there's all kinds of different Arthurian. There, there's retellings. There, the the uh, uh, What was the one that came out that um, was it Joe Cornish directed? The, the, the King and the... I have it on Blu-ray. The King and the something. Uh, that was different, too. But, yeah, just... Somebody sent in, uh, let's see, what do we got? People keep sending stuff into me. Uh, Justin Toner sends in a tip and says, Hi, Rob, still grabbing Criterion Blu-rays before the sale ends. Order The Princess Bride and Doctor Strange Love. I have both of those on the Barnes & Noble website today. Next week, a friend is having me over to watch Come and See. Can't wait to check it out. Yes. Man, I'm telling you. Actually, you can't see the reflections. What, what do I have for my... Here's a... Yeah, some of them I've already filed. I, I haven't filed these yet. I, I got Failsafe. Um, I got, of course, War of the Worlds, even though I have the Australian indicator version. I got Do the Right Thing. And I also got uh, Tirima, which is pure Paolo Pasolini. And I've never seen Tirima, actually. Uh, I've heard it's good. Um... Scout Trooper Prowl sends in a tip and says, Hey, Rob, love the channel and the content you create. With you being a collector of many amazing collectibles, have you ever looked at accounts to do toy photography? And what are your thoughts? These are There are some amazing artists out there. Scout Trooper Prowl. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go find you on uh, Instagram. And, and uh, I love, there's a, there's, I love toy photography. And even my girlfriend, Elizabeth, she's been, she's been, using my action figures and making films with them she wants to free all my toys so i know it's it's purely for personal reasons she wants to have access she knows that there's toys in boxes if she were to open them i would know and she would i would she would she, she would feel my wrath i get it so her hashtags uh, free the toys i get where it's coming from but i love great toy photography i don't know anyone by name but um i do like toy photography so yeah uh, thank you, um, thank you for liking the content I create. I will find you on Instagram. Are you also a toy? Well, why don't I look? Considering if you're on Instagram, I'll do it right now since you've got me. Uh, I'm going to go to Instagram and I'm going to find you right now, live. So, okay, you are Scout. Hang on, got to put this down. You are Scout. S C O U T. Uh, scout underscore scout uh, trooper, right? Yes. Yep. T R O O P. There you are, scout trooper Prowl, Anthony Prowl. Oh, dude, these are dope! Wow, this is wow. Hey, hang on a second. Look at this. Check this out. That's uh, from his Instagram. That's pretty dope, dude. Wow. Look at this. Look at this picture of... Wow, look at this. Can you see that? Wow, you're you're a very talented individual. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, so thank you for that. And now I'm following you, so that's exciting. Uh, Anonymous sends in a tip and says, Hi, Rob, I've sent this to John as well. I wanted to share the appreciation for your enthusiasm and enabling escapism within just talking about films. Look at Rotten Tomatoes reviews. Dark on Netflix is one of a kind. It's a journey you have to go on. I know, I know, I know, I do, I do, I do. Um, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth and I are going to, we're, we're going to binge it all together so we can go through season three. Um... Echo Base Network says, thoughts on Doomcock's Star Wars Lucasfilm rumors. 
Well, I mean, you know, uh, he's been he's been killing it. I was on a show with Doomcock yesterday, and uh, it was so much fun. I, I had such a good time doing this uh, podcast yesterday. It was great. Go find it on Twitter. It was a lot of fun. A starry-eyed girl was on it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, look, as I've told people on this show, I don't believe anything until it's in the trades, until it's on either Variety or or Holly Reporter, or Deadline. So, you know, who knows? I don't know what's going on. I, I, I think, here's the thing. Um, while I do believe that there is turmoil, there has been turmoil, there's been turmoil all the way through Disney's handling of Star Wars, but I think the turmoil comes from up top. It's not necessarily Kathleen Kennedy. Remember, it's Disney. It's Disney corporate that is probably the real villain. So I, I don't know. I haven't seen... Did something happen today? I haven't seen anything today. So um, Throgservation sends in a tip and said, Did Seth Rogen's film This Is The End, which I love, This Is The End, predict what is our demise? I mean, we have people acting violent and childlike about wearing a mask. Are we as stupid and vain as presented in that film? Oh, yes. We totally are. We're lame. lame -o. Uh, I, I it blows me away that people aren't wearing masks when they go out. What's the problem? I mean, I haven't I haven't not worn a mask when I've gone out to the grocery store in months. And you know what? It doesn't take a lot. I mean, it's it's I don't get it. I don't understand. Uh, Felix Leiter sends in a tip and says, "Rob, some evenings after waking up from a nightmare, for example, being stuck in an episode of Star Trek Picard." I check Reddit first thing to see if Tenet was delayed. I no longer do this after the last delay. Today on Campia Show, you compared your health. Uh, oh, you're probably still typing. Uh, Ex Bunyan Snipe says, Excalibur is based on Mallory's La Mort de Arthur, which tries to make everything from earlier stories by Jeffrey or Monmouth or Christian de la Troy fit together. Christian de la Christian de Troyes fit together. So the controversy is understandable, but that film is amazing. I love Excalibur. Love it. Um, uh, I no longer do this after... T t today on Campy Show, you compared your health. I know you've probably got one you're writing right now, so maybe I'll, I'll wait. Um, anyway, I will wait. Um, so there you go. Well, I'll see if you if you send this in because I was going to end this show. I wanted to remind everyone that tonight on Elizaviews, whining about movies, Elizabeth and I will share a bottle of wine, and we are going to talk about the delightful film Sing Street, and perhaps we will solve the riddle of the model. Who knows? Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Um, but we will drink wine. And I'm going to keep my inebriation going. I mean, two days of inebriation is pretty good. So, um, like, why not? During Comic-Con, it's it, at night. Oh, Felix, here, he finally sends in his second part. Here, let me read this again. Felix says, Rob, some evenings after waking up from a nightmare, for example, being stuck in an episode of Star Trek Picard, I check Reddit first. First thing to see if Tenet was delayed. I no longer do this after the last delay. Today on John Campia's show, you compared your health to not being able to see new movies of Marvel, Bond, I Survive, Maleficent, etc. Maleficent once said, For the first time in 16 years, I shall sleep well. Now, not knowing if or when I'll see Tenet, I finally know what she meant. Also, no more evil since. <laughs> yeah, you know, it kind of bums me out, man. I keep, I keep thinking about Warren, I think it was Warren Zevon who knew he was dying, and he said that he hoped he lived long enough to see the, the new James Bond movie. I kind of feel that same way. I mean, whenever I walk down the street to go pick up a pizza, I'm like, oh, my God, is this, is this the time when the bus is going to jump, the, jump the, the, the sidewalk and I'm going to get pummeled and I'm, I'm not going to get to see No Time to Die or, or Han uh, Justice is Served, you know, Justice for Han. I'm not going to see Top Gun Maverick. I mean, I've never been worried about not seeing movies before, but now I am. What if I have a stroke or I die of a heart attack? I mean, I'm old. I'm the oldest I've ever been. And uh, it would suck if I don't get to see the new Bond film. Truly. 
And on that happy note, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring an end to Rob Observations, episode number 400. What number is this show? 474. Can you believe that? 474. Marching toward episode number 500. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank you for supporting the channel via Super Chats and tips. I want to thank you for sending in letters, and uh, both to this show and to Eliz Views Whining About Movies. If you want to send me a letter or send me a video, you can at our website, theburnetwork.net. There's thousands of pieces of content there. Check it out. Um, so, yeah. Oh, Brandon Valenzuela sends in a super chat and says, A movie that I've always liked just for how absurd it is. Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Even the actors hated making it. You know what? That movie, oh, it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch. I've always believed that Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man should be on a, on a double bill with Tango and Cash. Although Tango and Cash, I think, is better. Although I haven't seen Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man since it came out. I could be wrong. But uh, yeah, that's that's a rough that's a rough sit for that movie. Uh, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank my moderators, Mr. Derringer and Robert Pariso, new uh, new moderators. They're here right now. I don't know who else is here. Let me let me look. Um, I don't know if the Richards here. Uh, maybe he's not. But I want to thank, of course, Mike Bodden. I want to thank the Richard. I want to thank Greg Smith. I want to thank, of course, Robert. I want to thank Mr. Derringer, and I want to thank Haynock. Uh, for being great moderators. Thank you very much. And remember, you can always go to the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page or the Whining About Movies Facebook page, and the Richard is always throwing watch parties or something. He's always doing something cool there. So go in and tell him I told you to uh, tell him to say hello. Or t tell him to say hello. Tell him that I told you to say hello to him. Anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, gentle beings, kind folks from across the 28 known galaxies, however you identify, I would like to say enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a better day. And by the way, come visit Elizabeth and I tonight on Whining About Movies, where we talk about Sing Street.